Good morning, Restoration Church. Let me say that again. Good morning, Restoration Church. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Are you happy to be in his presence one more time? We're going to ask you to stand with us as we worship God, whether you're visiting with us in person or if you're online. We just want to invite you to worship with us because God is a good God. He is amazing, and he is better than anything else that we can uh, ever imagine. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we shout in heaven. Lord, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. We love you. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We lift your name up. Father God, we invite you. Invite you, Father God. We invite you, Father God, to worship, to be here with us as we worship you, Father God. We love you. So, Father God, whether you're, uh, so as whether the people are in person, whether the people are online, we just want to lift God up. We just want to give you all the praise. Father God, bless us all. Touch our families. Touch our friends. Touch our homes. Touch everything it is that we do, Father God. So as we get ready to praise God, we want to give him a, a shout this morning. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. How many of y'all know that he has a great name this morning? Yeah, Father God, we love you this morning. We glorify you this morning. Yeah. Oh! 
to bless him in his place. We serve a mighty God. Yes. <clears throat> you love the Lord today. He's a healing God, a merciful God. His mercy never fails us. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. Hallelujah. And all my life you have been so.
you saying today all my life you have been so so good help me sing every breath that I am playing I'll sing one more time all my life morning to think of one good and faithful thing he has done in your life and usually when that happens and you think of one then you think of another and then he calls to remembrance all of the things that he has done and who he is and I can stand up here and say it's only been 26 years but all of my life he has been faithful the fact that I am here this morning in case you need a one good thing you are here this morning there is breath in your lungs you had breakfast you get to hear the word of God. You're in air conditioning. You're dressed up all nice and cute. That's more than one. Can you just thank him for his goodness this morning?
scripture comes to mind, and it was one of my favorites, and it's in Psalms um, 139, and it's not the typical of, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It comes before that, where the psalmist says, where can I go to get away from your spirit? Where can I run? Where can I hide? If I go up, you're there. If I go down, you're there. If I go in the darkness, you're there. If I go in the light, you're there. And I feel like there's somebody here where you feel like you've been hidden. You don't see him, but he sees you. And I feel like you need to hear that this morning. He sees you. The sheep doesn't have to go looking for the shepherd. It's the shepherd's job to take care of the sheep. So I pray, Lord God, over your sheep this morning. You're so close. Where can we go to get away from your spirit? Where can we run? Where can we hide? If we go to the depths, you're there. If we go in the darkness, you're there. Yea, though I walk through the shadow and the valley of death, you, you're rod and your staff, you're comfort me. You are with me. Lord God, I pray for even more. Your spirit is so heavy in this place, but there is so much more of you, Lord God. So I pray that as we continue in this atmosphere of worship, you would just envelop us completely in, in the totality of who you are, Lord God. May we just be wrapped up like a little cocoon blanket in the goodness of God this morning because you are so good. You are so faithful, Lord God. And I pray that you would remove the blinders, Lord God that have covered our eyes from seeing exactly who you are, Lord God. And I know that we can only see in part while we're here, Lord God, but I pray that you would bring a fresh outpouring even deeper, even more, even greater, Lord God. But we stop and we say, thank you. All my life you have been faithful. All of my life you have been so, so good. So with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And Lord God, there is so much of your goodness this morning. And we thank you and praise you for that as we transition on in this service to just hear your word and see your goodness and see your faithfulness and just hear directly from you this morning. We thank you and praise you and give you glory and honor because it is all yours right now. In Jesus' name, we pray. We'll continue to stay in an atmosphere of worship, but we're going to go ahead and transition. You have a few moments to meet and greet your neighbor, and then we're going to go straight into rave. Good morning, Restoration Church. Rave is about to begin, so at this time, we invite you to find your seats, quiet down, and get ready for announcements. We in the house right now. We about to get this done today, right here and right now. Okay, y'all have a seat, sit down. Hey, I heard, not everybody heard the joke last time, so guess what? I'm going to give you a two-for-one special, starting with number one. What do you call a student that made C's in medical school? I don't know, what do you call them? Hopefully not your doctor. <laughs> you don't want to be your doctor. You just skating by. All right, y'all, sit down, have a seat. It's time for... Rave. <laughs> Easter Sunday is coming up and we look forward to celebrating that day with all of you. And we wanna let you know that at the Madison campus, we will be having two Sunday morning services on that Sunday, April 9th, I believe it is. April yep. 8 or 9th. That sounds right. One of those two, whatever <laughs> Sunday is that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll be there on that, that Sunday for yeah. 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. As a reminder, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Okay, okay. Reminder. Okay. Thank you. Reminder. <laughs> you might need to keep that on. As a reminder. Thank you, Miss <laughs> Peggy. You. As a reminder, there is a new requirement for Children's Church. Yes. 
So if you currently have a little one in any of our children's church classes, we do require you to now serve either a Sunday or a Wednesday. And as Tiffany said, we've got the little chairs for the little students so we can teach them about Jesus. So we need your help <laughs> in order to do so. having a water baptism at Restoration Madison on April 16th. And you can sign up using the QR code around around It'll around here. Like, uh, like a picture of yeah. stuff. Yes. Now Kenzel, do we sprinkle? Yeah. You, you go full submersion. All the way. All the way for Jesus. All the way for Jesus. As a reminder, growth tracks have officially concluded for this season. So April is going to be observed as a rest month. Tiffany, yeah. wake up, tell us what that means. That means we're resting. That means that we are taking this time to just rest. You know what I mean? So we can be rejuvenated for May. Now you still gotta wake up on Sunday morning to come That's to right. church, but there mm -hmm. will not be any Wednesday evening growth tracks. We invite you to partake in communion during today's service at any time if you feel led. The communion elements are available and can be found near the giving boxes at any Restoration Church campus. There are multiple ways to give at Restoration Church. You can do so on our website, through our app, or by filling out a giving envelope and dropping it in an offering box. So every single week at Restoration Church, we pick a local church or a mission to lift up in prayer throughout the week. This week is a little different due to some of the things that have taken place this week. This week, will you please join us in praying for Covenant Presbyterian Church and Covenant School and the Huntsville Police Department. So please lift them up in prayer as we all need and lift them up even more so because of the recent events that happened. We thank you so much for your time, Restoration, and have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Hello, Restoration Church. It is me again. Don't you just love seeing my face? All right, I wanna welcome you, and I'm, I'm so like, a joke, but I am very honored and privileged to have the opportunity to welcome you all to church this morning. Thank you for joining us today, whether that be in person, and if you are joining us online, I wanna say thank you to you as well. Now, if this is your first time with us, we would love to meet and greet with you after today's service. Um, typically, we meet over in the Connection Corner, but today is a little different. We are actually having Fellowship Sunday. So, um, in case you guys didn't know, it's first Sunday, and that means we get to eat. So um, just to give you a little bit of an appetizer, a little, a little uh, teaser here, we are having a baked potato bar, catfish, and coleslaw from, from LJ's Backyard Barbecue, and then some chicken tenders as well. So it's quite a little menu there, and I hope you're hungry. So please join us um, after today's service in the fellowship hall to meet and greet and eat. Amen. Um, as a reminder, you saw this on rave, but I do want to remind you that if you do currently have a student in any of our next gen or children's ministries, we are asking that you serve. If you have not already um, spoken with one of our children's ministry leaders, you can do so, or you can fill out those cards that are on the information desk and drop those into the offering box. Also, we will be having two services on Easter Sunday. So next week we will have a nine o'clock and 11 o'clock service. And because you guys have been so faithful to that previous announcement I just made with the requirement with the children's church, there will be children's church for both services. So we invite you to join us for either of those services. At this time, we are going to pray for our tithes and offerings, for the communion elements, for the word that's about to go forth, and then as well for our focus prayer, which is Covenant School in Nashville, as well as the Huntsville Police Department. So if you would please join me in praying. Lord God, we thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. We thank you for this morning and the fact that we are able to come together to gather in your house to hear your word and to glorify you on this morning, Lord God. We thank you. Um, we just thank you for your goodness, Lord God. Right now, we lift up those at um, Covenant School and Covenant Church over in Nashville, our brothers and sisters. 
And Lord, we know that we do not grieve as those who do not have hope, Lord God. But I pray that as they are going through this time of grief and through this time of mourning, that you would renew their hope, Lord God. That they would feel all the feelings they need to heal, Lord God, but you, they would not lose their hope, Lord God. We pray that you would fill them with hope. And Lord God, I pray over those babies. And I rebuke every ounce of trauma that would try to come against them, that would try to stunt their growth in you and in who they are and their identity that you have called them to in the kingdom. So right now we break the spirit of fear off of those children and off of those parents right now. I speak peace over the minds of the parents, Lord God. May they know how to steward their children well, but when they not fear for their safety, Lord God. May they know that first and foremost they are children of God, but may they not fear, Lord God. I pray safety and protection over them, Lord God. I pray that you would send angels on assignment to watch about them, Lord God, and just to keep them safe. And I speak peace during this difficult time. And Lord God, I pray over our police department and Huntsville Police Department. We pray over that family, Lord God. And not just his physical family in the real life, Lord God, but over those other officers that saw him as family. Lord God, I pray that you would renew their hope. I pray that you would help them to be steadfast. And I pray that you would watch over them and guard their steps, Lord God. May they hide in the shadow of your wing. I thank you for each and every one of those men and women who have made this dedication to serve others, Lord God. We do not take it lightly, but today we honor them, Lord God. And we pray that you would watch out for them, that you would bless them abundantly, that you would go forth and and watch them in protection and safety. And I pray, Lord God, that you would give them divine wisdom on how to respond, Lord God. I pray that you would bless that family, Lord God. I pray that you would just bring healing to their life, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, because you are good. And we just lift them up in prayer this morning, Lord God. We pray for the tithe and offering, Lord God. We know that everything is yours in the first place. We thank you for your goodness and how faithful you have been to us, Lord God. And today we give back in honor of you, Lord God. We press, play, pray that you would bless it and break it into abundance, Lord God. I pray for the communion elements, Lord God, that we would take it in remembrance of you and what you have done, Lord God, your body that was broken and your blood that was shed, Lord God. And I thank you for your goodness on this morning. We speak over our pastor that is about to bring forth the word, Lord God. I pray that it would go forth boldly, Lord God. I see like a a train just charging forward, Lord God, that every word that you have for your people this morning would go forth unhindered, Lord God. May you just give him fresh wisdom and divine insight into the scripture and into your goodness this morning. I pray that like when Jesus blessed the bread and broke it, Lord God, you would do that for us this morning with your word, Lord God, because we don't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Lord God, we study our appetites for this morning. We thank you for the food and the nourishment that we're going to have after today's service, but we thank you for the food and nourishment we're about to have in today's service. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness on this morning. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and we say your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. In Jesus' name. Will you help me welcome up Pastor Ray Hutchison to bring forth the word? Thank you. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Wow. It's almost uh, as if we need to stay right where we are right now. I don't think he's finished right now. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father God. (laughs) Praise you, Jesus. You are good indeed. (laughs) You are the only good God. And all good things come from you. Thank you what you've poured out on your house of worship this morning, God. We receive it with gratitude. So we thank you, Lord. We honor you. We glorify you. 
You are the Savior of our souls. Have your way today, God, with your people. Father, let me become less so that you become more. It's all about you. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Whoo! Well, isn't it good to be worshiping the Lord on Palm Sunday? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. One of the very few times you will see me wear a tie. <laughs> Before I get started, I, I want to give honor to some folks, starting with my wife, Betty. She's been by my side for 35 years. I love you, honey. I love you. I choose you every day. I also would like to, to honor Pastor Huey and Miss Ruth. Wow. You know, we are so blessed here at Restoration Church to have such godly servant leaders who take seriously the condition of our souls. Let's give it up for them one more time. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Miss Ruth. Wow. I'd also like to give a shout out for our worship team. Truly anointed, truly anointed. You know, those who are here for the first or second time, maybe even the third time, and to those who may be watching online, we honor you today. Thank you for joining us. I want to give a special honor to, and I like to do this every time I preach, is to recognize and honor those who are working behind the scenes for us so this is possible. Those child care workers, the, the audiovisual team, the ushers. And the many others whom without, this place would just be a shell. And I want to remind those folks behind the scenes about how Jesus has a special place in his heart for you. When he performed his first miracle, that wedding in Cana, who did he use? Hmm. He used those working behind the scene. He let them be a part of his very first miracle. So he loves you guys so much, more than you realize. So think of that whenever you start feeling a little overworked or unappreciated. That like, like Kendall said, Jesus sees you. And he loves you dearly. Mm. Mm. And then finally, I want to give a, some honor to the most important person here today. Mm. You know, we're actually his guests. He's not our guest. Mm. He's always the first one to show up to prepare this place for us. And he's always the last one to leave and you know, he doesn't leave until every one of his guests receives something from him. Mm. Be ready to receive something from him. And you know who I'm talking about, right? Holy Spirit. Can we give him some honor and great and thanks? Thank you, brother. You're an amazing man. How about that message he preached last week? Woo! You know, I've got a question for you. Have you ever thought about that word restoration? We walk into Restoration Church. We're members of Restoration Church. Have you really ever thought about that word? You know, it is the act of restoring. It, it means renewal. It, it means to repair. It means to rebuild, to bring back to wholeness, to restore. And that concept of restoration, it's based on the root word rest. So there must be rest before there can be restoration. And last week, Pastor Huey, he 
taught a powerful message titled Resting Faith. And if you weren't, if you weren't able to be here for it, I highly recommend you go out online and look it up and watch it. You will be greatly blessed by it. Amen. During that message, Pastor shared a scripture with us, Hebrews 4.3, which says, Those who believe can enter into his rest, and this rest has been available since he made the world. You know, when I think about how we are restored and renewed and repaired in God's rest, I'm reminded of an ancient Japanese art form known as kintsuji. Show the picture, if you can, of... There it is. In kintsuji, when something of value becomes broken or cracked, it's glued back together using gold. All the cracks are filled with gold. It now becomes more valuable and more beautiful than before. Come on. God is good. That's a picture of what God does with us when we enter into his rest. He turns ashes to beauty. So every time you enter Restoration Church, know that you are entering a place of rest because the presence of the Lord is the presence of the Lord is here. The healing of the Lord is here. Kintsuji. Now, I, I would like to share a story with you, but honestly, I'm afraid that I may have shared it with you before. And my, my brother Dan can attest to this, that when you reach a certain age, you begin to become very redundant. So I would like to share a story with you, but I'm afraid that I may have shared it with you before. One person got that. <laughs> You know, the memory is not what it used to be. And I, I remember uh, all through my childhood that my father had hundreds of stories. It's like he had a story for every situation in life. Well, as he got older, that inventory of stories that he had, be, that he had it began to get smaller until he only had four or five stories left that he could remember. But he would apply one of those to every situation that we were in. And even though I would tell him, Dad, I've heard that story before, he would just ignore me and tell the story anyway. <laughs> I'd always laugh like it was the first time I heard it. You know, come to think of it, this started happening to him when he was about the age that I am now. <laughs> <laughs> So if you've heard this story I'm about to tell you, don't say anything because there's at least one person here who has not heard it. And to that one person, this story's for you. So it goes like this. A man named Jack. Well, let me stop right there. Is anybody in, in the room named Jack? Got anybody in here named Jack? Raise your hand if your name is Jack. Okay, we're good. So a man named Jack, he was walking along a steep cliff one day when he accidentally got a little too close and he fell over. On the way down, he reached up and grabbed this branch that was sticking out of the rock and it stopped him. But when he looked down, he was horrified. It was a thousand feet to the bottom of this ravine. Man. He couldn't hang on forever, and there was no way for him to climb up. So Jack began yelling, what I'd do. He's yelling for help, and he's hoping that somebody passing by would hear him and maybe throw a rope over to him. Help! Help! Is there anybody up there? He yelled for a long time, but nobody heard him. He was about to give up when he heard a voice. And it said, Jack, Jack, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I, I can hear you. I'm, I'm down here. I can see you, Jack. 
Are you all right? Yes, but who are you and where are you? He said, I'm the Lord, Jack, and I'm everywhere. The, the Lord? You, you mean God? That's me. God, please help me. I promise, if, if you'll get me down from here, I'll stop sinning. Sound familiar? <laughs> I, I'll be a really good person. I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Easy on the promises, Jack. <laughs> Let's get you down from there first, then we can talk. Now, here's what I want you to do, Jack. Listen carefully. I'll do anything, Lord. Just, just tell me what to do. Okay? Let go of the branch. What? I said, let go of the branch. Just trust me, Jack. Let go. There was a long silence. Finally, Jack started yelling again, Help! Help! Is there anyone else up there? <laughs> Obviously, Jack didn't have resting faith. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We're going to go on a little journey this morning on Palm Sunday. We're going to start reading the scripture, Matthew 21, starting at verse 6. And it says, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. You know, Luke and John both record that, that event, but they have a few little nuances in their recording that Matthew didn't cover, and I'd like to share those with you so you get the whole picture. Luke 19, verse 41 and 42 says, Now as he drew near, he's drawing near to the city, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And then John in chapter 12, writing about that event, says, The next day the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors. I brought this up so we know it's Passover time. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches. John's the only one that, call, that says that they are palm branches. And went down the road to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Thank you, Father, for your word. We just hope that it sits on our hearts, God. Soften our hearts now. Look within us. Prepare them to receive what you have for us, God. 
And we'll give you glory for it in Jesus' name. You know, when I started studying Palm Sunday, I wanted to look at this day through Jewish eyes, first century Jews. And when I first started, I got, I got to give a shout out to, to Joel Ness. He's up there in the balcony. He's our Jewish roots pastor. I went to him and said, hey, can you help me out here? He's put me in the right direction, gave me some literature that, that has expanded my knowledge, and I want to thank him. If you've got an interest in knowing more about our Jewish roots, go and see Pastor Joel Ness. He will uh, definitely help you out. You know, I wanted to understand the people who saw Jesus ride into Jerusalem, the ones who were actually there. I, I wanted to understand what they knew and how they felt. What was going on in their lives? There are so, I discovered, so many rich nuggets in the story of that event. Mm. That event that we call Palm Sunday. You ready to go back to the first century with me? Let's go. So my study began with a specific question. Why did God choose this particular day for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem? Was it just a random day or did it have a specific meaning to the Jews of that day? First of all, let me tell you, God doesn't do random. No such thing. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew language, there is no word translated that means random. There's no word translated that means coincidence. There's no word translated that means luck. Sometimes I've got to pray for an individual when they say, man, I'm so lucky. I got so lucky, especially if they're a believer. No such thing as luck in God's kingdom. I discovered that the first century Jews did not call this day Palm Sunday. That came like four centuries later. It was called Lamb Selection Day. Whoo! <laughs> Which is the title of today's message. I'm always impressed to see what the graphics folks have put up. That's amazing. Lamb Selection Day. From Genesis 22.8 that reads, God himself will provide a lamb all the way through Revelation where it says in, ver in chapter 5, verse 12, worthy is the lamb who was slain. All through Scripture, Christ is revealed as our Passover lamb. And just to make sure we didn't miss it, God sent his son into, into Jerusalem on the same day that the Jewish people had been selecting their lambs for the past 1,500 years. There's more. When Moses is providing the Lord's instruction to the Israelites concerning Passover in Exodus 12, he told them this. He said, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, Nisan, Palm Sunday, each man is to take a lamb for his family. The selected lamb must be without blemish. Take care of the lamb for four days when all the community of Israel must then slaughter them. Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem four days before Passover is not a coincidence. The lambs chosen on lamb selection, they stay with the people for those days leading up to the slaughter in order for everyone to observe the lamb's perfection. During those days of inspection of the lambs, the perfect lamb of God was present daily in the temple for all the people to see him and to observe his perfection. All the people could inspect him, and his final inspection was by the highest authority in the region, Pontius Pilate, who declared, I find no fault with him. 
not a blemish. Jewish historians cite that all the sheep during that time, now get this, came from Bethlehem and were brought into Jerusalem through the sheep gate. Thank you, Jesus. At that time, only the sheep from Bethlehem that had been raised especially for this purpose were allowed to be used for selection. Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem and was raised especially for this purpose, also entered Jerusalem through that same sheep gate. It was here at this gate that hundreds of thousands of people were waiting for the arrival of their Messiah. They threw their coats and palm branches down on the ground as if rolling out the red carpet. The significance of the palm branches is that they were a symbol of victory in war. It was customary for the people to wave and throw palm branches at a king who was returning from a victory in battle. As Jesus approached the city on the donkey, he came over the Mount of Olives. And as he came over the mountain, he had a panoramic view of the city and the hundreds of thousands of people waiting to welcome him. The scripture says that when he saw this scene, he wept because they did not recognize who he really was. I didn't quite understand this verse because many of them knew that he had raised Lazarus from the dead and they just witnessed him healing blind Bartimaeus. He just healed him hours ago or less. And they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the Hebrew means save us. So they were shouting, save us, our king. And son of David means the Messiah. Save us, Messiah. So they knew who he was. That's why I didn't understand why he wept because they didn't know who he was. I thought it was obvious they knew who he was. (laughs) But watch this. So... Why did he say that they missed it? Stay with me on this. The rabbis and teachers of the law during that time were struggling with the scriptures that painted a picture of of Jesus as one person and a picture of Jesus as a different person. The rabbis who studied the Messiah prophecies concluded... That in the scriptures, the prophets prophets spoke of two different messiahs. That was what was being taught to them in the first century. There were two messiahs. One was the messiah who was to come, suffer, and die. And he was called Mashiach ben Yosef, or Messiah, son of Joseph. The other Messiah was the conquering king, and he was called Mashiach ben David, or Messiah, son of David. What were they singing when they saw him? Messiah, son of David. Isaiah 52 and 53 are the main scriptures that describe the suffering Messiah. And I want to read that to you. Who has believed our report? This is Isaiah 53. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our inequities. 
the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Mm. Mashiach ben Yosef. Messiah, son of Joseph, who was to come, suffer, and die. That second Messiah who was to come and rule was called Mashiach ben David or Messiah, son of David. There are numerous scriptures that address the Messiah as king and conqueror. And I've got a couple of short ones I want to read to you. Isaiah 11, 1 through 4 says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes. Nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. And decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Psalm 72 says, Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness, and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. That's who they were expecting to come. To break in pieces their oppressors. This is why he wept. Because they thought he was only son of David. The mighty king that was going to save them from their oppressors, the Romans. They didn't get it that he was also son of Joseph, the Messiah that was to suffer and die. He was both. He was the Messiah king that would conquer death, not the Roman army. He would free them from the bondage of sin, not the Roman oppression. He was the suffering Messiah that took on their sin and had to die in their place as payment for their transgressions. So when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, everyone just knew a a regime change was taking place. Yeah, new sheriffs in town, baby. This was the day that God's people had been praying for. They had been under the boot of Rome. They they had been reduced to nothing more than a puppet state. They had no king because the Romans wouldn't let them have one. The Romans would let them appoint a high priest, but the Romans said, we have to approve whoever you choose. Mm. And 
to make sure your high priest never gets any ideas about leading a revolt to create a Jewish state. <laughs> We're going to keep those ceremonial robes that he wears locked up in our guard tower. <sighs> you can get them out for Passover and other holy days, but only if you behave yourselves. And in case the people who came to the temple get any crazy ideas, we've built a giant fortress named after Mark Antony. It's called the Antonia. And it's right butted up against the side of your temple. That's right. We built it on the side of the heart of your nation, your most precious building, the structure that means the world to you. So now your temple will fall under the shadow of our fortress. When you come for Passover, look up. On the rooftops all around the temple, we've got Roman soldiers with their spear tips gleaming in the sun. There are 600 soldiers on duty there at all times. <clears throat> this fortress has four giant columns that are 14 stories high. Filled, 600 soldiers. We can look down on your temple area to make sure nothing gets out of hand. But despite the crippling political power of the Romans, the Jews had not given up hope. <laughs> the ancient prophecy said a savior would come that a king would someday ride into, into Jerusalem to deliver God's people from the evil of the ungodly. They knew what the prophet Zechariah said. He said, I will guard my temple and protect it from invading armies. Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerus Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I would think after hearing a prophet say that, Jesus is coming to kick some butt. That's what I would have thought. He's going to come and take them out. He's going to kick them out, spank them, and make them go. That great prophet Isaiah confirmed what Zechariah said in chapter 62. He said, the Lord has sworn to Jerusalem by his own strength. I will never again hand you over to your en enemies. Excuse me. Never again will foreign warriors come and take away your grain and wine. Within the courtyards of the temple, you yourselves will drink the wine that you have pressed. Tell the people of Israel, look. Your Savior is coming. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. <clears throat> Can you imagine what that day must have been like for the Jewish people? The rabbis had said it would happen on Passover, that the Messiah would come and judge the ungodly. Well, it's Passover week. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews from all over the world who have come to Jerusalem. You know, some historians say that there could have been as many as one to two million people there. Oh, thank you, brother. As they fill the streets, a victory parade starts to form at the edge of the city. This thing was two miles long. And it led all the way into the center, the heart of Jerusalem, right to the temple. Jesus is coming this way now. He, he's riding on a small donkey. He isn't coming like the arrogant Roman generals on their war horses. He's coming in humility like Solomon did. The son of King David who rode on a donkey through this very same Kidron Valley when he came into Jerusalem to take up the throne as king. Jesus is riding that same that same route, except he's coming over the Mount of Olives where the prophets had said he would come from. Overwhelmed with joy, the people begin to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. 
He's closer now, and people are yelling, Bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise the new son of David. Blessed is the king of Israel. Can you imagine what it must have sounded like? Oh, my goodness. Hundreds of thousands, maybe a million people singing their ancient Passover song. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Just think about that. How powerful our worship team is when there's only four, five, or six people up here singing. Can you imagine a million people singing at one time? Those hills must have been vibrating. As he approaches the gate, I can only assume what they must be thinking to themselves. This is what I assume that some of them may have been thinking. Finally, the Messiah is here to judge the ungodly. He's going to remove those pagan Romans from power. <coughs> he will ride right up to the Antonia fortress and make his way inside the very heart of the ungodly. And he will drive them out. Then our glorious temple will finally be free and cleansed from the ungodly. I'm sure they were kind of thinking that. I would have been thinking that. But then something unexpected happens. Jesus doesn't go to the Roman fortress. He goes straight to the temple. Oh, my goodness. He entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers. And he said, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of thieves. I wondered where that came from. Well, the law of Moses commands that every male of Israel must redeem his soul by giving half a shekel as a temple tax. Half a shekel. The Jews couldn't bring their Roman or Greek coins into the temple because such coins had pagan images on them, and that would be blasphemous. <clears throat> so there was a currency exchange where a Jew could pay a fee that, check this out, went to the local bankers, Jewish bankers, and the high priest's family. Sounds a little bit like corruption to me. The, the law of Moses also required the people of God to offer animal sacrifices. We knew that. But if they had traveled a long way to come for Passover, most of them didn't bring their animal with them. It would be a burden to, to care for an animal. Some people came that took them months to get there. They would just bring some money and buy an animal for their offering. Prices were jacked up. But they could buy anything from a bull or a lamb or a pair of birds in a wicker basket. Whatever their family needed, they could buy that in the temple. The money changers and those who sold animals for sacrifice, that used to be outside the temple, out in the Kidron Valley. But when Caiaphas, their high priest, who was approved by the Romans, by the way, became high priest, he let him move into the temple. He let him move that market into the temple, into the courtyard. <coughs> he, Caiaphas, was corrupt to his core. He was the main leader who was putting Jesus on trial later that week. He was the one that was taking him around from person to person, getting him inspected and accusing him of high crimes. Moving the market into the temple, it guaranteed Caiaphas income. But as the people had prayed for years, the Messiah did come to judge the ungodly. But to their shock, he confronted them, not the Romans. Whew. What Jesus found in the temple was bankers making money off of every poor person who comes there to pray. He saw them keeping poor people from worshiping. Let me ask you a question. If the Messiah were to ride into town today, what would you be expecting him to do? Serious question. What would you expect? If Jesus walked through those doors right now, what would you be expecting him to do? 
Would you be expecting him to deal with the people in your life that are difficult? Would you be expecting him to deal with a prodigal child? Maybe you have someone in your life who has hurt you deeply. Maybe you have difficult circumstances in your life like financial hardship, a, a struggling marriage, a sick loved one, a sick loved one. Or maybe you have an illness yourself that needs healing. When the Messiah rides into town, you just never know where he might go or what he might do. I believe that just like on the lamb selection day, he will go directly to the temple to drive out evil. <laughs> that temple is in the heart of his people. When Jesus returns in triumph to judge the ungodly, he will start with us. Peter makes it clear in 1 Peter 4, 17, that judgment begins with the family of God. Here's the good news, though. Remember what we read earlier in Matthew 21? It said that after Jesus had driven out the evil from the temple, then the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. It's kind of like that Kent Suji vase I showed you earlier. When you allow him to do the restoration of your heart, his temple, then you become more valuable and more beautiful than before. And he will heal you. Would you please stand? I'd like us to go into a time of prayer. And I want you to get with two or three others. We, we do this every Sunday. And I've put a couple of prayer points up. What I would like you to pray how I would like you to pray, and some things I'd like you to, to, to pray for and pray with the people that you gather with. First of all, I want you to ask Jesus to cleanse his temple, your heart of any unrighteousness. It starts there. And then I want you to pray, but before you do the number two bullet, I don't know if they're up there, they are. I want you to share with your group something that you may be struggling with right now that you need Jesus to intervene for. And the reason I want you to do that, several reasons. First of all, he tells us to confess and we will be healed. Then the people in your group can pray specifically for you and for that struggle you have. I want you all to share with each other and then pray for one another. Pray that he would heal someone in your group specifically or someone in your life specifically or help you with a specific struggle that you are having. So ask him to cleanse your heart, share what you're struggling with in your group, and then pray for one another in that group. Jesus has rode into town. He's here. He's going to go to the temple and cleanse it, and then he's going to heal. Amen? So if you would, go ahead and start praying.